Hey there, and uh, happy, what day are we on? I don't, Wednesday, oh my gosh, it's Wednesday. Um, I know that it's been a little bit of time since I've done a drink with, hey Ben. Um, but today we're gonna be talking to um, Caitlin Vincy, which I'm super excited about actually because of a couple of different reasons. Let's see, ah, she popped in here. Um, Let's see if it's working. It is Wednesday. That's wild. My, I have no idea what, what this is. Hey, girl. Hi. Hello. It works. Thank goodness. Oh, thank How are you in real time? I know. I'm good. I'm good. I feel like the last time we talked on the phone, it was breaking up like crazy. Remember? We were trying to talk after your race or before your race, I think, for Fox. Right. And it was like absurd connection. It was, it was, well, it's because um, as much as I love to say sprint, but sprint it doesn't often work. Actually, it doesn't even work in my home. This morning I was on a rehearsal call and I couldn't get in for another like three or four minutes. I'm like, I'm sorry, it's sprint, it's what it is, but hi. So frustrating. You look beautiful. <laughs> you look beautiful, this as is always. No, but like, girl, like your lighting is good. Your makeup's good. How, how has that been that process of like, actually, were you always a good at your makeup? Um, so I've always like kind of been interested in watching tutorials and things like that. Cause I was in the field for, you know, seven years yeah. before I came into the studio and you do everything yourself, obviously when you're out at the racetrack. So it's, I think it's really hard to do your job and look the part sometimes with the elements out at the track. So I just had to teach myself how to do everything. And so it's been fine since I've been home, uh, doing the quarantine shows because I already kind of knew how to do certain things. Yeah, that looks good. Shoot. I mean, I want, you can give me a tutorial. That's Oh my gosh. That's you look awesome. Don't even no, say that. No, but you know what? It, it's so interesting because that is one of the shifts that we've seen in our industry. It's like mm -hmm. you become a makeup artist, you become your own stylist, you become yeah. your own, like you know all these things that I think people forget uh, in this process. That like you know, God bless those humans that do it for us on the regular, but like right. that's a completely different outlet and totally different scenario. It is. It really is. And I mean, I guess I get a little spoiled when I'm in the studio because we have people who do it for us, which isn't even really negotiable. It's just <laughs> what they do in the studio. Yeah. Um, but even like yesterday, I, I finally got to return to the studio and do my first show. And we can't have, you know, makeup and, and hair people uh, at the in the building at the moment. So I still did do it myself, which is fine because I'm yeah. so used to it anyway. It was really like a new thing for me when someone else was doing it. Dude, how good was it to get back in the studio? It was really nice. It really was. But it, you know, we're, our company is taking this whole pandemic and the virus very, very serious. So it is a totally different dynamic uh, in the studio. It's a bare bones crew. I mean, we had like, um, in the actual studio myself was just me uh, and an AD and one camera ops. And then there's in the control room, of course, the director, the producer, uh, teleprompter operator. And that's pretty much it. I mean, our CP that's was there too. Skeleton crew. It's a skeleton crew, but we still did it. You know, we still are doing shows. We're doing, I think, a lot with very little, which says a lot about our team um, and, and the fact that we can still get content on the air with not even half the resources. It's insane. It really is. And, and oftentimes when I started these, like, a drink with, um, I just want to make sure, like, you know, you obviously have been at home now in studio a little bit. I'm still at home, still in quarantine life, but that's like, and, um, you know, every time I just want to say a big thanks to those who are kind of out there on the front lines who are still out there. I cannot believe there are people who are still like, I mean, it's what, I don't even know it's blurs day for me. I forgot what, what day it was when we popped on here, <laughs> but like, what, like these people who have been at this for, you know, now two months, really. Um, yes. so big thanks, big thanks from me. You have anything to say to them too? Absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't be able to even be doing what we're doing with the with the races if it hadn't been for the efforts of all the first responders and the people who've been really in the throes of this virus and making a difference. Without them, this whole world would be in a much uh, different place. So we're very, very grateful for them. Uh, I have some friends who are in that business, so I know what they've been up against. I know the things they've been dealing with. And it, it's it's hard to even fathom I think what some of those people ha have been going through. So right. we are very, very, very grateful. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Have you, have you, did you guys do the whole like grocery ship kind of thing for a while? Did anybody, did Hubby go out to the store? What were you guys, what was your kind of process? Yeah. 
So my hu husband would usually go get the groceries. We weren't taking my, like Cadence, my daughter, or anybody yeah. with us to go do that. So he, he was typically doing it. And we do the um, HelloFresh meals, which has been like a yeah. huge help through the quarantine. Do you um, like those? I do really like do. them a lot. Uh, yeah. And I am not like a chef by any stretch of the imagination. I had never even cooked before and, until I tried this. And it was a huge game, <laughs> yeah, which is really so sad when you're 32 and you still haven't learned how yeah. to cook. That's pretty pathetic. There's so many other things don't, it doesn't matter. Let someone else cook. <laughs> That's right. So, but I yeah. tried it and I really liked it. And it's, it's like kind of fun for me to something to do every day at the end of the day, like for my husband and, and whatever. Yeah. So. It's been fun and it's nice because it ships right to your door, which makes a huge difference. Uh, you don't even have to go out and get the supplies. But I mean, they mail you the um, ingredients, but you still got to cook everything and put it all together. Yeah, so you're still like actually in the process of learning. One of the things I want to do is get better at from like a cooking, like a true cooking, yeah. um, doing the whole like going and getting cooking classes and all that stuff. Um, so does that feel like you're getting a little of that experience because they kind of like teed up enough? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. Like I had hardly done anything before this. So it was a big change for me. I'm like, Oh, so this is how you roast potatoes. This is how you <laughs> like the most I basic things I learned to do, uh, that you would think I would have already known how to do. It's, Dude, it's kind of sad. Do, I can't do hard boiled eggs. I, I screw up hard boiled eggs every single time. I don't yeah. know what it is about it because I've never even tried. So kudos to you. You've tried that. <laughs> I, <laughs> I haven't. Not successfully. Um, okay. So yeah, last time you and I talked, we had the opportunity to lose signal multiple times, but of course, like we were underway with the season and I just, at that time I was picking your brain, of course, as to like, mm -hmm. pit, give me some pit advice. And Jim Bishop below is saying like, I, my daughter wants to get into broadcasting. You know, it's interesting that I'm, you and I both are established within the career, yet we're still getting advice from others in certain ways. And mm -hmm. we're constantly learning. But if yes. we were to look back and say, what advice do you have for someone else? What, what is that at this point? Um, like initial advice to start your career? Because your story is super rad. <laughs> super, super weird. Um. <laughs> but that's part of it, right? Uh, so when people ask me for advice, I always tell them to start out local. I mean, that's like kind of my go-to is if you can find a way to uh, go to either a local team, whether it's baseball or soccer or racing or what have you, um, that's a great place to begin. I like your mug, by the way. Here's mine. <laughs> Cheers. Great mind. great mind, sister. <laughs> that's amazing, actually. Just water, people. I water. wish it was. Okay. I wish it was bourbon, but I'm going to wait. Um, like words get really hard after a glass, at least. <laughs> like, if I was drinking bourbon whiskey right now, this would be a complete mess. Um, <laughs> Understood. But anyways, actually, you know, to preface starting local, I would say start in college because that's what I yes. did, you know, and, and some people are like, well, going to college, you, you know, it's really not going to benefit you in the real world. It is what you make of it, right? Because I did three internships while I was in college, which made a huge difference for me. Were you journalism? Yeah. Communication okay. studies um, yeah. and, and journalism's under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. But, you know, doing internships in school made connections already with people in media. It already allowed you to have a quote unquote resume once you graduated to, right. to show to companies, hey, I do have some experience, even though it was an unpaid internship or whatever it was. Um, totally. My internships were with the local news station in Norfolk, Virginia, um, WTKR News Channel 3. Cheers. And I had the, <laughs> the morning shift. So I would leave my apartment at like 2.30 in the morning because morning news reporters start really, really early. And that was the shift I was stuck on. So I was doing that in tandem with my classes. Mm -hmm. And then I also did um, working for the athletic communications department at my university, which was a really unique situation because I don't know how many universities offer this, but they would hire about six students a year to, and actually pay us a small amount to work on the university sports, like writing the programs. Like, sports, for the like, like an SI, like sports information kind of stuff? Yes, yes, just like yeah. that. And we would work on their game day programs. We would help score the games. Yeah. Um, like we would go to the football games and work the scoreboard and just random things they would have us do, uh, which I didn't really like doing the scoreboard because I was like, I cannot screw this up. Like everybody's <laughs> looking. Too much pressure. Words, that, words might be hard, to, but numbers are even yeah. worse sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. I was like, wow, I really don't, I don't want to mess this up. Um, 
So I did that obviously through my university. And then I also worked as an intern uh, with the USAR Pro Cup series. I moved to Charlotte for a summer right before my senior year of college. And I did like a PR type internship with them. But they also knew I was interested in TV. So they let me do like a mock little TV spot for them that summer that didn't air anywhere. It was just for the experience. But I still have those DVDs. Maybe I should go look at those. And I was going to say, did you have you pulled any of those old, old bad boys out? Oh my God. When I look at them, I'm like, wow, I was very green, <laughs> but um, it's still fun to reflect back. Cause uh, you know, it was when I was in my 20 years old is when I started. So um, also while I was in school, I started writing a NASCAR column for the school paper. I just pitched it to him and I said, Hey, no one's doing this. Maybe no one cares about racing here at the school, but can I write it? So I did. And so all those little things are just very, very small things, of course, but they helped me upon graduation when the job came up at Langley Speedway, right. um, for where they were looking for a reporter and a host, if you will, yeah, right. for this, this, this show they were doing um, on, in local TV there. So when I auditioned for it, I got it. And, and that was a huge uh, moment for me because that sort of springboard the whole thing, honestly. Yeah. Isn't that insane? I think another part where you've just identified to going back to like the Jim Bishop down, you know, who mentioned for his daughter is, and this is for male, females as a matter, is the idea of creating your own job, you know, creating your own opportunities. Mm -hmm. What you did from, you know, creating the column to see, hey, I see this need uh, within. So here, how can I help add value to that with that particular need? Right. Um, and I think like in today's day and age, especially with everyone being a YouTube, you know, everyone being a brand ambassador, our, the act of journalism has shifted into followers and what that means. And, you know, mm -hmm. a totally different approach than maybe when you and I were in school for journalism. But I do yeah. think like, a big part of that is creating the it content is. still, right? It really is because we did Langley Speedway for a season and then we weren't sure if we were going to have sponsorship to do the show again. So I was like, well, I still want to have a way to talk about racing on camera. So that was when I set up a home studio uh, in my home and the guys that I worked with at Langley came over and donated one of their cameras to me and set it up, got it situated. And I started doing reports from my house and posting them on YouTube. But then NASCAR Illustrated started seeing them and started using them on their website, which was huge. Cause then it was like, my little reports were next to like Bob Pockris. Okay. <laughs> He's one of the best in the business. The and, and he used to work for Scene Daily back then, which is what the website um, oh, version was called. Small world. So that was huge. And it also like just gave me more content to put on my demo reel, which I was constantly updating and sending every couple of months to Speed Channel, now Fox Sports One. <laughs> the it. guy I sent it to, who and, and the people who initially saw it are all still there. They are my bosses to this day. So That's wild to think about. It really is because it was almost it's over nine years ago now. <laughs> So, and, and, but, and that's and that's another thing I think too, and I know that I've struggled with this at that point of making those relationships, building relationships, but having them be genuine and sincere in the build, mm -hmm. and not just, uh, you know, not just hey, you know, interested in the job, but it's also like I want to get to know this person as their life, like you said, like back then nine years ago, how that has influenced and dictated your life now, but it's not just because of you know not only the person you are on camera, but it's also the person you are off camera and what that means and how you built that relationship as well. Yeah. And for me, this was never about being on TV. You know, I'm, I'm a journalism professional. I love storytelling. I love learning the people and the stories of this sport. There's so many interesting characters, no matter what level you're at, whether it's grassroots level or the cup series. So for me, that's what it's about. Obviously my career has evolved and changed over the years from reporter in the field, pit reporter hosting. But at the end of the day, that's what we do. We're storytellers and providing content that is so interesting i think to the viewers and the fans and learning things about the people in the sport that they wouldn't initially know totally. and that's that's what i was doing even at langley and i mean to your point though um going back to the advice thing that is a huge part of it i think social media and this whole landscape has really opened the door for people to put themselves out there a lot easier than you could have 15 years ago right um because you can self-promote, you can like tag people so that people see your work that would never normally be seeing it. Like there's a lot of little ways to get your face and your work out there. Um, and when I was coming along YouTube and Twitter and all that stuff, it was well, sort of beginning phase. Totally. And so I, I used it all the time to the best of my abilities to try and get noticed. Yeah. Um, so yes, there is a certainly a level of... Um, creating your own job and, and being 
innovative in that regard and and just thinking outside the box and having something that's a little bit different from everybody else absolutely so like at that point right and i i've oftentimes said this too it's like you know blonde haired blue eyed girl blonde haired green eyed girl brown whatever it doesn't matter from the context the idea is what value are you able to bring that's a smidge different than maybe not that it's, it's not good bad or indifferent it's just a mm -hmm. little bit different approach like you're saying the storytelling and what you're able to get out of the athletes and how those conversations and your relationships that you've built with them are different than you know I just saw Hannah Newhouse jump in and how different that is from what she's doing or some Jamie Little and how she's really bringing out or you take mm -hmm. you know you go mainstream sport on the other end and take a Chris Budden or some of these other Molly McGrath these other women who have really paved the way in the industry as well yeah each of them each of you guys have your own you know specialty in some way story some yeah correct yeah. Everyone has a different way they went about it. Um, you know, on mine, just like a driver, it started at the grassroots level of journalism and just kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my roots. I'm proud to say that I came from Langley Speedway and that I started in, in college really going after this goal. Um, I had a very clear vision from a super young age. I mean, my parents... Like, why was it? I don't know. My parents joked that I would like do the evening news when I was like eight years old <laughs> in front of this old camcorder we had. So for whatever reason, I, from watching the news at night with my parents or something, I had an interest in that, that world and that field. So when I was in high school, I started working on the school paper and writing sports articles. So I knew even at a high school age that this is what I wanted to do. There was never really a shadow of a doubt. Finding racing happened uh, yeah, in college. That, I was gonna say, where did that shit come in? Um, well, so I, I went to races as a, a college student because Richmond Raceway was not far from my university. Mm -hmm. And it was a thing that a lot of our friends liked to go and do. Like it was fun, it was tailgating, it was a party, they'd make a whole weekend out totally. of it. So I truly just was a fan. Um, I went as a fan uh, initially, and then years later, I was able to get pit passes to Charlotte Motor you know, Speedway. That's when you know you you made it right then, right? Especially big big Charlotte like that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, I have pit passes. This is exciting. Uh -huh. But once I was in there in the garage area, I was like, okay, I I think this is the sport that I truly want to immerse myself in, and I want to learn this from the ground up. So that would have been I forget. So I was still a teenager, right. but um. But initially still, like, that connection that tie everyone has their mm -hmm. story to why they're you know yeah why that's important to them the motivation yeah because it. It, it just really stuck out to me i thought it was such a unique little world and every mechanic had his job and his routine and what he was doing i was like this is really quite fascinating the way everyone, so fascinating. it's like or organized chaos yeah. um Probably and i i knew i didn't know much about mechanics or anything like that the mechanical intricacies of the sport but i thought if i could learn that and succeed mm -hmm. in nascar as a journalist i would have really felt like i had accomplished something because i truly learned it from the ground up my dad wasn't a crew chief my mm -hmm. brother wasn't a driver you know it was like it was a completely different situation that i had to learn it all yeah. from the from from the very beginning there was no <laughs> real exposure to it is that shift so you know like and i know this about the way that you communicate and the way that you connect with the drivers of teams that you know from all different angles and obviously your interest in storytelling as well is as well is there a shift into a and you've covered super i mean you've covered racing you've covered all that other stuff but from a lifestyle is it food obviously maybe not food but you can see you can drink you know whiskey and like the idea of like going out and doing some lifestyle stuff with the same passion of storytelling is that a shift you want to you want to get into at all? Um, or a shift? I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, you're talking more about like the culture that just kind of comes with all of this, right? Right. Well, in a sense, but like from the motor. So obviously, like your passion is the storytelling and the NASCAR and the racing mm -hmm. and the motorsport and motors and that angle, right? But also, what you're passionate about is something you can take into you know, music or, mm -hmm. you know, lifestyle of some nature, whether it be travel or you, you travel, you hike, you can go on adventures. How much of that could, do you see in your future in a career standpoint? A I don't know. That's an interesting question. I mean, for now, it seems like the motorsports and all of that has been so all consuming and very encompassing of my life. Uh, you mentioned Supercross. That was the first time I ventured out and did a different sport besides NASCAR uh, and sort of did the moto world. And I really did love it. Um, that was an incredible experience. I absolutely love that sport. I mean, for people who may not have never watched a Supercross race, you're missing out. You should totally... <laughs> you should totally watch one and, uh, and go to a live event whenever that's going to happen again with fans. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I do think that sometimes I think about future goals and like what else I would like to do. Are there other sports I'd like to branch out to? Do I think I could do different types of TV? I do. But for now, this has been so uh, just like I said, it, it keeps me busy 24 seven. You don't really get a break from from it. You have a very brief off season to begin with that I haven't been able to really entertain doing much else than what I'm doing at the current right. moment. Well, no, and so I was talking to, like, Alex Rossi about this on one of these drink whiffs, and we were talking about how this is, like, for some, and you mentioned off-season, but, like, this for some is, like, another off-season in a sense. But yeah. in, on the other spectrum, like, you have been nonstop from the at-home studio shows. What was it, like, week one? Like, actually yeah. week one? That you, they, there's, okay, let's get an at-home situation going on. Right. It, it, it happened pretty quick. Uh, it didn't take Fox long to figure out they could still do shows and they could do them remotely. Um, I think there were some growing pains, obviously, with that, but they started using that Zoom application and we started knock on, knocking them out. They weren't they weren't easy. I'll say that. I, I think they had their share of challenges more so for our production staff. Um, yeah. People don't realize what production uh, what they go through to put television shows on the air. They're a really talented group of people that we work with at Fox that are all in all the time. It is a grueling schedule, especially with Race Hub. They put out so many shows a year, uh, Monday through Thursday, every week for 38 weeks. Plus, they come on the air before the season even begins. So, and it's those a lot. Are the, right, those are the people. I mean, these are the behind the scenes. This is the, mm -hmm. the, the behind the black curtain, if you will. That, it, it, of course, there's people like yourself and others who are on camera that get to you who know that but man it is accolades that these guys deserve it's insane to get it, to get everything moving it is insane and i know they've been working super hard and and probably pretty stressed through this time period so if any of them are watching i just want to say thank you to them because they're phenomenal they really are i don't i don't even know how half of them do what they do right <laughs> like the, from the tech like you hook up this why this i'm right this morning i was in rehearsing for something else and trying to figure out the box and, and the, you know the headset and how what goes in and they know it's just <laughs> so impressive and god bless them for you know the ability yeah. to make it and it works right it, is, it really is impressive it is and it's a lot of work getting all the footage the b-roll cutting the graphics going through all the pieces feeding them to edit like it's it's just a huge undertaking and especially now with with way less bodies working on it and not having their resources of the full-blown studio so i i certainly commend them on everything they've been able to do and and what they did on sunday is nothing short of incredible putting a race on like that for the cup series um and still having i think the majority of the camera angles and not missing stuff on track and being able to queue up the replays and all of those things. It's hard. It's so much harder than people realize. So they did a great job and I don't expect um, the product to, to suffer at all. It's just going to keep getting better as they get more into a routine and figure out uh, the new normal. How, how, yeah, the new normal. I mean, the, it's like a victory. I mean, I can't imagine obviously not being on the crew and what that was like, but that, that how much of a victory that must have, been. And the viewer, the numbers were good. Over 6 million is, is, is pretty impressive, I think. You know, I don't know if they really knew what to expect going yeah. into it, you know, because um, the Daytona 500 pulls some really big numbers, but that's a whole different kind of thing. Uh, but I do know from talking with some people this morning at Fox um, that they were really happy with, with the number that they were able to generate for that race. It really is. It's really hard to believe. And you mentioned that obviously, like for those who don't know, maybe, um, you know, Caitlin's family, I mean, your, your husband's involved in racing cadence comes now the balance. One of the things I find so amazing about what you've done. And I kind of mentioned a couple of other women in the industry as well, who have found that balance. And I think if there's advice for, especially women in this case, maybe some men out there too, but being a, a working mom in our industry is no short of, I mean, it's a challenge on a lot of different fronts. And I just admire your ability to find that balance. And I think it's scary for a lot of people too, right? It was scary for me also. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. And that was like kind of my first thing when I, you know, realized I was pregnant, how I was going to manage it. Cause at the time I was still on pit road and, and it's all those things you don't think about like our packs. Like I couldn't wear that anymore. They had to create, <laughs> 
you know, a backpack version for me to wear on pit road for all my equipment. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Cause yeah. you can't wear it around your waist and like just different things all change. And, uh, I worked really late into my pregnancy too. Um, in the dead heat of the freaking summer, which was, was pretty challenging. Um, so it started out then, like once you're pregnant, you got to figure out that balance. Then once you have your baby, you figure out a whole new routine, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's the adaptability, been moving, adaptability, baby. Yeah, it's been a moving target for us from the beginning, honestly, because um, the both sets of grandparents don't live in the state, which is hard. But they both came in when the baby was first born to help us kind of get through the remainder of the season. But, you know, right now she's kind of in like a, a little preschool type thing. So she's been really doing well with that. And uh, I just think that she's been learning too. She loves going there. She actually cried when I had to pick her up one day. Because I don't <laughs> think she wanted to leave because she has little friends there now. And like, yeah. you know, she's learning stuff. Uh, we also have a nanny who helps us too on weekends, which we haven't had to use her for a while because we haven't had weekend work which is bizarre uh through the quarantine blake and i were with her the whole the whole time um okay. and we would just when he would have call, conference calls or when i would have shows we would just swap back and forth now that yeah. he's back in the race shop um she started going back to her little school and um stuff like that so okay, so, okay that has like did you guys do what was like your big takeaway of it being a homeschool teacher too or like a preschool teacher did you guys <laughs> was that well I mean, she's still really young to, to do lesson plans. I okay. think that right. they do that obviously at her school yeah. and we tried to do certain things with her, but, uh, she's, um, not always the most pay attention type <laughs> person. She gets bored really easy. And, uh, yeah. so it's tricky. I would say the advice for people is to definitely find good help, find a good system around you of like, whether it's a nanny or a school or a daycare and, and what have you. And, and really utilize that to the best of your abilities um, for your own sanity. <laughs> and um, just finding good people. Because if you can't help yourself, if you, you can't help others too. Like if you're mm -hmm. not, if you're not doing things to kind of support the person and the woman that you are and that yeah. way you're not going to be able to give and support others either. And I will say I'm really fortunate because one of my um, main producers, coordinating producer that I work with the most is a mother of two. And she's almost about the exact same age as me. So she totally understands sometimes um, the parameters that I have to work around uh, yeah. that maybe some of the other on-air people don't. And that I'm, I'm telling you is a huge help. Like, cause she just gets it and she'll understand if I'm like, Hey, I, I gotta come in a little late or whatever it might be. If there's um, extenuating circumstances that might cause a situation like that. She's so understanding. And she's just been a great person for me to talk to about a lot of different things from the business to parenting, to juggling it. Cause her husband also works in the sport. So it's almost like an identical situation. And yeah, it's just great yeah. to have somebody like that to, to lean on and, and try to work through this with someone else together. Cause it is a lot. It, it, it really is. And, um, you know, with my husband's job, he's gone a lot. So, I mean, right. in, in the typical NASCAR world, it's Thursday through Sunday, pretty much every week, you know, from right. February to November. And that, that gets really, really hard. I think because you just, you're operating like a single parent for over half the month. Right. Cause yeah, it was your shift from being off pit road, you know, from yes, you know, yeah. Cause yeah. that was that was a huge shift for you to get into a studio. So now you're mm -hmm. working a show, mm -hmm. and the difference of that from momhood, if you will, mm -hmm. mama, you know, yeah. being a mama yeah. in that in that position, like that that shift had to have given you a little bit of security for sure in the way of being able to balance it too. And I pushed because I wanted to be in the studio. I wanted to make that next jump to a, a studio host. Like I said, I had done seven years in the field with garage reporting and pit reporting. And um, I just was ready for a change. And I also knew if I could be in the studio, it would keep me here. At least one of her parents was here every weekend, which I think is yeah. is, um, is right by her. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I had kind of felt like I'd reached my cap on pit reporting. I didn't feel like I was really getting where I wanted to go with it. So I kind of put the bug in the air to do the studio stuff and it ended up working out great. Uh, so now I guess I've been in the studio for, this is my second full year doing it. Yeah. yeah. I think. Is that right? I can't even remember. Maybe it's the third. I don't know. I don't know what day it is. So, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm at that point. <laughs> so, 
But yeah, it's a big change when you're used to traveling every weekend and you've done that whole scene for all those years and then you come back and, and you're Charlotte based and you suddenly realize, oh, I have more time to like wash my laundry. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, the dishwasher is constantly going. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, quarantine, quarantine life has given me an ounce of that a little bit. I, I think I've been home more in quarantine than I have been in, in entire years, in the yeah. last five years, and right. consecutively for sure for years and years, you know? So it's been interesting to find that. Um, I got the other day, I got super stoked on. Um, I don't know if you've tried. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can become a spokesperson for them because I think it's the most impressive um, dishwashing <laughs> is the Dawn Power Wash. Um, <laughs> cute, cute. <laughs> is someone <laughs> getting it? <laughs> Is that your mom? This? Yep. No. <laughs> this is my boyfriend. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> he's popping in there. Um, it's really oh, hot. That's awesome. um, but the uh, Dawn Power Wash, that product, has been yeah. like the godsend. <laughs> you, they you need to sponsor you. you. That yeah, was like I'm the you, best you, sponsor plug. <laughs> If you, that's unintentional, but kind of intentional in the way that like, if you, if you, I have now connected with appliances and products that I yeah. never, when you're on the road, you never get a chance to do. So totally. I'd say, that's so funny. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that was, that was, um, that's been one of the things I think is interesting about being home is connecting mm -hmm. with you know, even out on the roads where I start seeing neighbors I've never seen before. And I do find that to be an interesting shift. Um, but one thing from a mom, going back to being a mom in the industry, talk, give me, give me a little bit of the background on how it felt in the emotional department, because I think there's a fear for a lot of women to find that balance between being a mom and still maintaining your career. And I know mm -hmm. that, you know, NASCAR has been great with you and, and Jamie and a few others in the process. And in IndyCar, there's some other, you know, Kelly and some women, they really do make it, but others struggle. And I know that I've had this conversation with myself. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find that balance between um, losing a job, maintaining your job, having a kid, being on the road, and everything else in between, you know? So um, it's not really a secret that we weren't planning to have a child. So when we found out, it was, it really caught us by a big surprise. <laughs> and so the emotions went through a very wide range, honestly, because right. um, I, I wasn't ready for that yet. Uh, mm -hmm. It was really difficult, but I can yeah. honestly say if that hadn't happened, I'm not sure if I ever would have um, like done it. You know what I mean? Like I, I was a person who wasn't really sure if I wanted a family. And now oh, I am so grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am so oh. grateful that it happened the way it did because I would have never known what I was missing out on. Do you know what I mean? That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was so career oriented and I felt like, well, I can't have a kid if I'm traveling for 38 weekends of the year. That's never going to work. Yeah. yeah. How you know, that? but yeah. there was a different plan for me. And thank the Lord that there was because it, it was obviously difficult at many points, but it's the best thing that can happen to you at the same time. And you don't realize that in the moment because you don't know what you're in store for, right? Because you've never been, you've never dealt with it before. Totally. So, and the uh, insecurities that come along with that in an in, in, in industry where not to say appearance is what, but there is a value within an appearance. There's value in your knowledge. There's value in your mm -hmm. insight. It's kind of the whole package to get to it is. that you're in. You have to look the part and know the part and be able to do the mechanics of the job. And so there is a lot of moving pieces. And as I mentioned, you know, when you're pregnant, at some point you're going to have to take maternity leave and someone else is going to get to do your job or what, what have you. And yeah. it may take you a while to come back, you know? And so there is a lot of layers to it. But yeah. for other women listening, like, let me be a prime example. You can do it. Trust me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because my husband didn't even live in the same state as me at that point. You and can I do still, it. And <laughs> yeah. I still managed. That, so anyone that, can do it, trust me. That's why people say you're a boss lady and you find the balance. And exactly. And I think that's what's super impressive about, you know, what you, and again, being more of an outsider, it's only been a recent, that our lives have overlapped in other ways. It's interesting mm -hmm. that we've never really fully talked, you know. Until this year, I know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I remember one of the times when, so I've had, we've had, you and I have had same producers in certain, you know, yep. jobs or whatever along the way. And, um, and I remember 
I had been following your career and then I just remember being like someone saying um listen to Caitlin Vincy's voice like that's the voice you want and is that something that has always been innate career-wise just out of curiosity is this been your voice the whole time or did you get a voice coach no voice coach it's it so not... you have such a great voice <laughs> <laughs> thank you, you, you I do. think it's because it's a lower um not a baritone, but it's it's a definitely a lower octave than like the high pitch. You know, here we are at such and such track. It doesn't have totally. that sound to it. No. And and peop I never was instructed to get a voice coach, and I had always heard that I had a good voice when I first started out. That was one thing that people it's did so always strong. say. So strong. Sometimes I feel like it, when I was on pit road, it'd be harder to get it to cut through because it is a little bit lower. Um, and of course you change it a bit when you're on the air, you inflect differently and you enunciate differently and, and everything's all about having energy. Um, but I do think certain people are just, they, they kind of have some certain natural abilities. I, I don't know if you would agree with that. I mean, I think that sometimes I have people asking me for advice or feedback or like people coming into the business and some of it, you just can't explain. You're either kind of born with certain things or you're not. <laughs> right. I do. I, I use the word, I use the word uh, blueprint a lot. I think mm -hmm. that there are times where and, and blueprint more from a behavioral standpoint and psychology and whatnot, but the idea of there are, you're right. I think people are innately bored, you know, being a swimmer, right? There are, mm -hmm. there are certain fields that I have that my older brother, for instance, who is good at certain things of swimming, right? But like the feel of the water is, a, is something that you're born with. You can work hard, you can be determined, you can be driven and you can gain, you know, speed if you will by practice and all that but i do think that they're you're right um it's what makes someone that next level when they're mm -hmm. born with it um, but i would go back to the college days because i felt like my education was very valuable at a young age because okay. you were doing public speaking courses and you mm -hmm. were doing different internships talking in front of the camera you were learning how to write how to you know speak eloquently connect, connect and with the camera too like there's connect with the camera yeah, and, and having a certain vocabulary and a vernacular and all these things are really important that you really can't learn it as well way later in life. You know, those are skills that are kind of brought into you at a young age that you just kind of continue to hone uh, and, and master as you get older, as you go through your career. Well, additionally, you're a reader. So, like, that's the reader. advice. There's, you are such a reader and you're... Um, <laughs> um you are <laughs> i didn't see what happened i can't tell what he did his little fellow sneaking around here um <laughs> but um you're you're such a reader yourself too and that's something that from a vocabulary you talk about vernacular you're talking about things that you have done along the way connecting disarming the audience um your vocabulary and the strength that that is some of those are learned right but there mm -hmm. are things like your voice that the way that someone reads on camera you can't teach somebody how to be read on camera you know like it's a look it's a feel it's a vibe um yeah. and i do i love i love your reading some of the books that you posted i think i mean it's so it's, but it helps it's little things like that that add to your career that people maybe don't know that that's something that can be done you yeah know? i've been a reader my whole life i swear it makes a huge difference in this profession too i just i believe that it does uh mm -hmm. so yeah sometimes i'll share different things that i've been reading and um, I recently shared that I've been working on my own fiction novel for over two years now that I'm hoping what? at some point yeah, will we'll get published. It, it, I feel like a fish out of water because I don't know a lot about that business. So I've reached out to a couple different people who work in publishing and people who've had some books published to see kind of the route they went. Um, and I have sent it to a couple agencies, the manuscript through the quarantine. But they say it can take up to eight weeks to even hear back. So <laughs> Goosebumps. <laughs> Oh, awesome and amazing. Well, be amazing. What's I'll send you a copy if it actually comes to fruition. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd buy it. Just, I will buy it. I will buy two and support you. <laughs> it's about, it's, it's the, it's a mystery, a suspense, okay. but it, it's written from the perspective of a girl who works in, in broadcast news. Oh, that's going to be great. Yeah, no, I'll buy it. You don't send, I buy, I support. <laughs> you don't send, I buy. <laughs> I, 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 I'm so, that is, that truly is that something that you wanted to do along the way you think or is that something that has again another development of your career and where you're at in your life just saying I have something to share this is my this is not my mission but part of my mission in my life is to kind of share the story yeah I would say so it yeah. again you know I had always been a very avid reader from a super young age 
Um, and I think a lot of the skill set that you learn as a journalist is transferable to people who are uh, novel writers or even um, nonfiction as well. When I started looking around and really reading into a lot of the biographies of authors of books I had, so many of them worked in television. It was crazy. I, I had never really noticed it, like whether they were a producer or some of them were uh, like investigative reporters or what have you, and they could, they had this mind to craft these fictional characters and, and craft a story. And so I, I thought to myself several years ago, I was like, I could do that. And I have kind of a pretty good idea for a plot line if I could actually yeah. get this going and get the characters out there. And of course, I'm drawing from firsthand experiences working in television. Television isn't the, the theme of the book. It just happens to be what the character main character is involved in. And yeah. what better thing to write than from what you know? That is so impressive. Yeah, I think from a from a... a writing what you know, and this is something that I've been really kind of focusing in on my life is kind of being an advocate for those ex life experiences that you have had. And I'm sure within your book, there, those will, those will stream through as well. Yeah. I, I had a conversation with someone once that said, like, if you've gone through something, you know, become the advocate for it. use your platform and you have the mm -hmm. responsibility when you have a platform to kind of start creating good out of some of those experiences that were maybe hard or hardships along the way. Right. Um, I'm sure in the book, you know, I'm sure picked up on a few, I'm sure we'll pick up a few of those. Little you will. Things. But, but those, but some of those major challenges, I mean, from, from your end, from our industry too, what are some of the challenges? Like I have my list of, of oh. has there been anything that really pops out to you that is resounding? Uh, we could probably be on here another hour if I really went into this in, in a know, lot Instagram, of depth. Instagram will kick us off here in the next, in the next couple of um, 10, 15 minutes, but. I just, I think you really have your work cut out for you, um, you know, in this business, because there, there is a, it's, you're only as good as your last show is the mantra, right? That we all recite to ourselves. It's like a common phrase used in the business. So there's a lot of pressure on you to perform really well every time you get out there. And once you make it to the national network level, there's nowhere else to go. You, you've reached the pinnacle at that point. So the room for error or for a slip up or a mistake the, the margin is so small, which I think, you know, that's, it's tough because, you know, I was having a conversation with one of my um, producers, John Morris yesterday, and we were kind of talking about everything that's been on his plate. And he was like, yeah, but don't, don't discredit what you guys are doing. Cause like he, I said earlier, you have to look the part, you have to be able to deal with yeah. people speaking to in your ear while you're also speaking simultaneously on the air. You're moving the conversation along. You know where you're going next with your traffic. You know your counts and getting it perfectly out to break and back on the air when it's supposed to. So he was saying it's such a unique skill set. You know, we were talking about hosting in particular in this conversation, but it's the same kind of thing even when you're in the field because you still have people talking to you and you still have so much going on that you need to be aware of. And I don't think it's yeah. for the faint of heart. I think it's funny to me because I feel like everyone wants to be a broadcaster, right? Everybody thinks and, that they can and do like, it. And now more so than ever, right? More so than ever. Literally, and I'm, I think it's because when they watch TV, it looks easy, right? Because the people yeah, who are the best at it make it look really simple. But it's right. so much more than that. And there's so many pieces that go into it that it's a really hard profession. So I think... I, I didn't fully know that when I first started out, right? Because you just... I don't think either of us did. Yeah. No. You just don't because you're not, you're not down the road far enough to really realize. But I, I am at such a good place. I feel like now with my career, because I'm really happy with the team that I work with in the studio. Uh, I go on that set and I'm so grateful and excited to be there. I've never had a day where I didn't want to go to work for the record. Yeah. That's how you know you found your true calling because there are no bad... You beat pills. It's so no true. days where you're like, right. oh, I got to go into work. Like, I don't feel that way. And this is, like I said, is year nine just at Fox. Never mind the years before that, that I've been chasing this. So how much of that do you think? So you mentioned gratefulness, which I think equates to, I think as a leader and right. I think again, in your position where you're at with the platform that you have, you have a responsibility as well, which mm -hmm. I think also lends itself to you being a leader within the industry. People look to you uh, for credibility and for knowledge and they trust you and, and there's humility that's involved in that. Um, and I've recently been studying the word leadership and understanding like what that really means. And it's basically, you know, from that angle of people trusting you with mm -hmm. this, with offering up humility. And in the sense, how do you get gain humility? It's through gratefulness. And I think like, do you think the shift 
from building yourself in a like you are you exude confidence and not in a in a way that is it, it's inappropriate confidence it's because you because of who you are you're established and you you put yourself in this position also via gratefulness and humility mm -hmm. do you think having that confidence allows you to be more comfortable in your job and in a place where you say like this is where i'm supposed to be your sweet spot I definitely think so. And I mean, and I really pride myself on being a simple person to work with, because I think that is one of the most important things in this business. Yes. The quickest way to have the, for everyone from executives to producers to fellow on air people respect you and, and enjoy you is being easy to work with. So that's like my number one thing before anything else is just don't let things get too to your head. I see this happen all of the time where yeah. it's just, like we're not curing cancer or anything. We're making television. There, there's no need for <laughs> for, for ego and, and to have an inflated opinion of yourself. I think you have to be really, really grounded with some of that. And it, and it's I, I notice it a lot with with people. They're they're just losing touch of reality a little bit. I think so. I have always felt like I had a better handle on that. And I've been told by more people than I can count how simple and chill I keep it, which. I think is very, very important in this particular line of work. Do you think that was how it always was? Is that how, or is that, was that learn? Was that one of the learned things or is that innate? Uh, it was innate. I mean, I think it was just the way I was raised. I was always raised to be respectful, have manners, treat people well, um, and not yeah. go about things the wrong way when it comes to the way you treat your teammates and your coworkers. So that's something that it, I, has always been very, very important to me. No matter where I go, with my career, say I'm freaking hosting Good Morning right. America, I'll be the same damn person that I am now. It's never going to change. Totally. So, because it hasn't and, to this and, point. And, and, you can and see I that. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Well, you see that that authenticity and the genuine in your way, right? Which, again, what makes you? You mentioned, you know, the the people who are the best in our industry make it look easy because they're so good at what they do. But that's also oftentimes, not all the time, and I, I don't want to discredit any of them. But but oftentimes it's because they're being their real version, the genuine, sincere version of themselves. Um, you mm -hmm. see it in the NASCAR, you know, in 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 the Fox shows, and you can see commentators who are just having a good time and who are really, really them. And you sit there mm -hmm. and you say off camera, that's who they are on yeah. social media. That's who they are. Who they are. Mm -hmm. And I think from you and, and that, and that angle for you, I think like, if you see you on social media, you're going to maintain that same role, that same personality. You're saying, you know, again, the genuine sincere version of yourself, which is why in your career, then if you host good morning America or the <laughs> today show or whatever it is, that same person will come through. Is that our goal? Would you want to do that? I, I wouldn't say it's a goal. I, I think that my goals are always changing. The weird thing is I don't have as many anymore because I'm pretty much where I want to be. You're targeted. Um, You're targeted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've reached a lot of, of the goals that I had on, on the short list. Uh, really on the long list too. I mean, th this has been, maybe to some people, it seems like it happened really quickly. To me, it didn't because I started when I was a teenager. So to me, I'm like, this has been a long time in the works. Um, yeah. But I think your goals are always changing. You're always thinking about what what could be next. Would I do this if it was presented to me? Uh, it's not something I'm, I'm actively pushing for at all though, because I love racing. Like, man, I racing is my true heart and soul because I've dumped all of my young all adult and adulthood into, <laughs> into this. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's been really hard throughout this time without it. it. It's a weird feeling when you are so used to having something not only be a part of your life, it's a part of your identity, like to the core of who you are. So when we didn't have racing there for a while, it's just like you, you feel so strange. It's like you've gotten yeah, broken up so with, strange. but you never wanted to break up. Like, yes, <laughs> that's yes. the it was, so, and that was, I think, in, in talking to, I don't remember, I think Simon Pagenaud or something on here too, it was, he said, I felt like I lost a little bit of that purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Which then you have to take a step back and say, okay, like, I know I'm, I know I'm not my job, but right. to your point, when it is your core, when it's like deep down in, deep mm -hmm. rooted, like that, is, and that's okay, right? That balance yeah. of knowing that like, it is like, be, I, I, that's the greatest analogy. It's like being broken up with, with somebody that like, you had no fair shot to say like, I, but I don't want to pretend <laughs> I don't want too. Right? I know. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. It was just a strange thing. And it was twofold, I think, for a lot of us, because not only were we apart from the sport, we were apart from television and yeah, like our, our people, family. And our, our, our family. family. Yeah. And I, I truly love the people I work with. So I, I miss them. And um, it's just been a strange time 
you know what I mean? To, to kind of go through all of this. Uh, but I guess circling back to your initial question about goals, um, I see myself being involved in the sport for, for a long time. Um, there's still some things I could do. I think there's still uh, one big goal that I kind of have in mind I'd like to, to do at some point. Um, I don't know when, you know, you just never know how things will change or whatnot, but I'm really happy of, of where I'm at now. Uh, and I, I'm really happy working with the people that I do. Yeah. So um, we don't know how this landscape is going to continue to change because of the virus. So that part, I think, is a little bit unsettling for everybody just because right. we, don't, we know. don't know. There's so much uncertainty. It There's has... so much uncertainty. Um, but but yeah, every every day I do feel super fortunate to call this a job because it doesn't feel like one. You know what I mean? And, and at the end of the day, we're we're talking about the best NASCAR athletes in the world and we have a front row seat to them and their families and their stories and their teams and their pit crew. And it's just, it's just awesome because at the end of the day, what a cool gig, right? What a cool gig. It's, and that also gives me chills. I think it's interesting too, because you have seen the shift of when, um, even take it back, take it back eight years ago. We'll take it as social media has come and gone, right? The idea that these drivers have personalities. Mm -hmm. You guys saw them being behind the scenes initially that these drivers had so much personality. There was so much guard to say that we, um, I don't know that anybody was saying, let's not, let's not put those personalities out there, but there just wasn't an outlet. Social media yeah. didn't exist in a way to be able to really flourish and foster what these personalities were all about. But how that has changed what NASCAR is, is the development of being able to say like, you know, Kyle, Kurt, the different personalities that those two have, Denny, and I mean, the, the ability to bring out the personalities mm -hmm. in these drivers different than maybe eight, 10 years ago, yeah. that's changed the game completely and the passion behind it for sure. Can I just say Denny Hamlin, I feel like has won the quarantine for social media coverage. That man <laughs> has posted some of the funniest, most engaging content I don't know who the heck is on his social team, but him what? and them are doing a great job. Um, <laughs> that's that said, um, yeah, to your point, it's an extension of their brand and it's really cool because again, it, it lets you pull back that curtain, right? And see their personal life. The, and the, you the, even exposing that too, right? <laughs> Differently than what other people could have been able to do maybe. Right, and, and I love that so many drivers have really gotten into embracing social media because you get to see their home life with their kids or their wife or what they do on their off time or their travels or their vacations or their pranks they play on each other and their hobbies outside of work. Because yeah. believe it or not, like that's a huge part of what we do, right? When I'm getting ready to interview someone, one of the first things I always do, go to their social media, see what they've been doing. What are they posting about? What are they liking? What are they not liking? What are they complaining about? What are they vocalized? You know, all those things. Yeah. You look at it because it helps you formulate your questions. Like, hey, I saw on social media, you did X, right? Totally. A few years ago, if you didn't have that, it's a whole other part of them that you didn't have access to. So in some ways, it makes our job a lot easier. Let's be honest. Uh, because it helps you get like more content for what you need. Totally. And um, I'm so grateful that we have that resource because totally. it really does help. It just helps everybody. It helps build everybody's brands. It, it makes it so much more engaging. The fans feel like they're a part of it because they are, because, you know, we've been seeing comments and things popping up. I love that aspect of it. And I try to answer a lot of people who will send me stuff on social media. I can't always answer everybody, but I do just like let them know, Hey, I see you. I see that you're there and you're supporting me. And, and, and I yeah, think that's really cool. Cause some that. people, some people have been supporting me since I was like 19 and I just was starting and I had like a little blog, you know? Yeah. So it's pretty cool when you think back on some of those people who have literally followed the journey from the well, beginning. I mean, I, I truly, when I posted it on Twitter today, just the response, you know, we, I mean, you saw a few of them as well. I know um, DGR Crosley, you know, you have the, the fans, you have these people who support you. How cool. Okay. As Harris is saying, hi, hi, Harris. And <laughs> Hello. We had Miss Weaver pop up in there and, uh, you know, Pat and, and um, it was Pat and Robert from Power Nation, but someone from Costa Rica. And, you know, you see those people uh, coming and joining the conversation and online on, on Twitter, you are so, so supported. Um, how, I mean, that's got to have given you some confidence along the way, the way to know that you're doing, you know, the right the right thing. Christian here, supported you Christian. since speed channel days. <laughs> Thank you. I miss the speed channel days. In fact, my hard card in NASCAR is still on a speed channel lanyard. I will not retire oh, that no. thing. I've had it for 10 years. Um, 
<laughs> it's probably like gonna get stiff and like not even move right because I've literally <laughs> had it forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the support is a lot, right? And what it's a very unique thing in life to have supporters in that regard. Uh, and it's not something I take for granted at all. People that are your quote unquote fans and your followers and, and people who enjoy seeing you on the air and always take time out of their day to drop a comment or drop, you know, a note to you and say, Hey, I really enjoyed your show that not many people get the opportunity to be in a situation like that. Right. And, and I, I really think that those who are, they should be tremendously grateful because it may not always be there. So when you have it, you got to really uh, appreciate those people around you that, that support you and are your fans. And, um, you know, if we have the ability to brighten their day and oh. give them something that they can look forward to every day, then we've done our jobs. You know, I was talking with someone, re that's a good point. And I was talking with someone recently um, about this and talking about my mission and what's important to me and, and some of the shifting goals, right? But how a life mission is, is, is something that your target is. And that's what you follow is your mission. Um, and the idea of someone was like, oh, you know, you should have been a teacher, you, sh you know, from the idea of you're connecting. And I said, but, but that's what's neat about our industry is there's a point that, um, you know, we get a chance to teach. We get a chance to learn from others. We get a mm -hmm. chance to, to express, you know, how mutually helpful one person is and how that actually helps me in a different way if I'm helping them. You know, I just, I, I find it interesting how our industry is such where there's, it, it, there's so much of uh, when you're not in it is an unknown. Yeah. And at the same time, um, it's really, really fulfilling in a way when it you is. kind of get to the point when you can recognize, sit back and say, I'm really grateful for the opportunities. Sure. Sometimes I don't like to put makeup on my face. Right. Like, that's not here nor there. <laughs> if that's, yeah. that's the worst part about it. I mean, I do find that to be uh, sometimes the makeup part. But, um, but it, we are in a really good place profession to be able to not only make a difference but but really learn a lot ourselves from a whole handful of people who are it's cool it's really yeah. neat. It, it is really neat and um i think there's a fascination a little bit with the television industry people look at it and kind of wonder what goes into that and so i love when we do those kind of behind the scenes segments and i know we have one coming up this week on race hub to kind of really show a little bit more i think in depth of the way that fox was able to put those races on um because it is intriguing to people right uh, it, there's just something about it i think that that is um appealing to yeah. learn what really goes into it uh, totally. So, yeah. Before uh, Instagram kicks us off here, um, okay, I want to ask about the NASCAR, since we haven't even talked NASCAR. Um, really, <laughs> uh, is there any chance that you're going to be, you're singing, that's something that I find amazing too. Um, <laughs> is that is that something you can ever, like, can we ever expect, you get a book coming out, can you, an album, anything? <laughs> One um, of my bosses is, well, well, you know Steve Craddock, obviously. Yeah. He's been trying to get me to sing the anthem for a race. I remember he made some jokes about that a, a little while back. And uh, I kind of was like, oh, my God, though, like, no pressure. You screw that up. You're not American, right? <laughs> so you got the words down. You got the words I do down. know the words. <laughs> you, got, just... you can do the words. It's just, yeah, the pitching, all that. No. Uh, I don't know. You know, I used to do a lot of singing with a band. Um, there was a Nashville-based band uh, before I had a family. Uh, I spent, like, an off-season kind of going around different cities with them, Virginia Beach, Nashville, um, we went up to Wisconsin or Chicago, I forget. Like we went to a bunch of different places and they would just let me hop on stage and do a song, you know, or whatever it was. And uh, it was fun, it was a cool experience. And it was similar because it's like entertainment, right? But it's totally different because you have a live audience staring at you it as you're doing so, this. It makes me so nervous. I get hot like thinking about, I could never be a performer on stage by any means. Like God bless y'all. Cause you like, probably could though, because again, I, it's similar to what you're doing now. It's just you think so, but like I did improv classes at Groundlings in LA. Okay, Instagram's going to kick us off momentarily, but I did a Groundlings uh, improv classes, and like even doing improv, I was just like, it was just yeah, it was hard. It's so tough. It is hard. Me. Well, um, I don't know if I'll be coming out with the album anytime soon, but I do enjoy singing. <laughs> it's a fun hobby on the side. <laughs> and perhaps maybe the national anthem. Who knows? Maybe, um, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, this is going to kick us off. Uh, obviously, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk much about the NASCAR stuff, especially those who were joined in for a little NASCAR chat. But follow no me, worries. Kaylin. She's got you covered with all of that. And um, I wish you the best. Cheers to you, sister. Cheers to you. Thank this you. was so fun. Thank you. I thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah. <laughs> Next time, maybe a little more NASCAR talk, but good Maybe, luck. yeah. Bye, Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>